Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. And thank you so much for making it to the very first session <laughs> of the day. Uh, we didn't know when we, you know, they, when they're planning things, they don't always tell you when things are occurring. And we thought, this is actually awesome because now we don't have to be worried about this for the rest of DrupalCon. <laughs> uh, my name is Melissa Bent and I'm a senior software engineer at, at Red Hat. And this is my first time presenting ever at a conference, which is kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I did, that just for the, I did that just for the clap, so thank you for, for getting that cue for me. Um, I am the lead engineer on our customer portal, which is at access.redhat.com. And there, there are many engineers, I should say this, there are many engineers on that, on that website. I'm on the Drupal portions of it. And uh, I live in Nampa, Idaho, so I got in here very late last night. Uh, I might be a little bit manic. It'll make for more fun during this presentation. And uh, I have a small farm with goats, chickens, and many dogs. I also love all things 3D printing, Lego, IoT, and anything to do with plants. So should we run out of topics related to Drupal, there are many others if you'd like to talk to about any of those. Yeah. And I'm April Sides. I am a senior software engineer at Red Hat as well, or a back-end Drupal developer. Um, I work on developers.redhat.com, cloud.redhat.com, and kubernetesbyexample.com. Um, I, too. I'm into the Lego, Harry Potter and Lego Harry Potter. Um, I work on the Drupal Community Working Group Community Health Team, the Alley Talks Accessibility Talks Monthly Virtual Meetup, and Drupal Camp Asheville. Speaking of, which is happening next month, July 7th through 9th, in Asheville, North Carolina, trainings, unconference, sessions, social events, all the things, check out the website, get your tickets today, or tomorrow, or whenever. Uh, back to our regular scheduled session. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the problem we were trying to solve. Um, we'll go over a little bit of the discovery process and talk about our solution. We will talk about a couple of different implementations that we're doing at Red Hat and then talk a little bit about our future plans. So the problem. This isn't a problem, but Red Hat is big. It's a global company with over 19,000 employees. Uh, we are built on open source principles originating from the Linux community. We use a lot of different technologies to serve our customers, and these technologies include open source and homegrown solutions. And RedHat.com is made up of multiple Drupal sites and single page applications like React and Vue. So our organizational data like product information and taxonomies ends up being duplicated in each site and app and managed by different product owners and content managers and engineers. So changing the data is a very manual process that has to propagate across all sites and apps by different people. And this leads to sad data. Um, pictured here is data from Star Trek being sad. Um, so we care about our data quality. Uh, we want it to be consistent and accurate. There has to be a better way, right? Some data should be managed centrally and made reusable across the ecosystem. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned this as well. Um, I came to Red Hat about two years ago and discussions about this topic were already happening before that. We kind of took it and ran with it. Um, so there are many, many people involved in this. We're just doing the presentation, right? So th this, is a, this is a group effort, but we are doing the presentation today. So I wanted to make sure I called that out. Uh, but when I, when I came to Red Hat, you know, you go through the whole onboarding experience when you come to a new company. You're like, what is this? What is life? Which team do I talk to? And I used to joke with my, my coworkers and say things like, I feel like every time I talk with someone here, it's like in Mario Brothers when you got to the end of a level and it says, I'm sorry, but the princess is in another castle. Because it would be like, oh, no, that's this team. And you talk to that team, they're like, oh, we don't do that anymore. That's this team. And it, that's kind of like a scale issue, of course. But really what it comes down to is because of that kind of, uh, like, because things were uh, split across multiple teams, across multiple time zones, countries, it means that we ended up with a, a data issue of who's going to maintain this, who's going to be our source of truth. And everyone agreed we needed it. But they didn't all, uh, we didn't always agree on who should be the person doing it, because we all have our own stuff, right? Everyone has their own things that they have to do. So I decided, because I work on the customer portal, that I would go ahead and try to do this, because we needed it. 
customer portal, uh, we, we try as much as we can to make it easier for our customers to get the most out of their subscriptions through articles and solutions, documentation, all different kinds of things. And we need them to be able to get to those things quickly and also be able to uh, show them, hey, you're talking about this. Did you know that we have this as well? All those kinds of things that in a normal world, in a normal like small Drupal system, yeah, you make an entity reference, you, you, know, you make taxonomies, you make connections that way. But when you have all these different systems and this complexity, it becomes a problem. So we had the greatest data needs as well on the portal because we're a support site. So we don't just support the newest and best thing. We support the, the server that's you know, 12 years old that's running in someone's back office as well. And they still need documentation for that. Or they still need, oh, I'm having this weird issue. Oh, here's an article on it, right? So we have the greatest need for, for information on this. And specifically around product data, meaning versions, end of life data, document, all these different things. Um, and between that, we also had multiple teams working on this together. And it becomes, it, at scale, it was getting difficult to grow that and do it in a way that's maintainable. So talking specifically and airing a little bit of dirty laundry, <laughs> when I was onboarding onto this project, uh, I started realizing that some of our most important pages were actually just Drupal nodes the classic page content type where you're like, I need to get this up today and we're gonna just put it into the body field. And then it's like, the thing I say all the time is what happens when for now becomes forever, right? Where you're like, I'm gonna put this up here for now. And then three years later, you're like, we're still copying and pasting HTML into this field, which happens all the time, more than we'd like to admit. So we see that kind of thing happening, which is a bad developer experience. It's a bad customer experience because it leads to things where things get out of date, things get, uh, you know, it's, a product update comes out and it doesn't trickle down the way it should. So additionally, it makes, because we're not using the CMS in the way it's supposed to be used, it leads to us recreating content in multiple places all the time. Again, it, it created fragmentation, issues with maintenance, issues with uh, just getting our best foot forward to our customers, but also, again, our, our main goal was to get customers the information they needed as quickly as possible so they could be successful. Uh, and then, yeah, the biggest one I think is at the very end here, which is that we had lost time, not just for customers, but for developers doing things that they shouldn't have to be doing with their skill set. Um, the, the thing I keep telling my developers, I, I want to get them out of the content game. We shouldn't have to have a developer making these changes because it's too complex for a content editor to do. So these are the kinds of things we were work looking to fix. So uh, specifically what came out of this discovery process is that we needed to be able to share our data in a way that scaled well across all of our properties. We needed it to be flexible enough that we could work with our team, but also other teams. We have a lot of other teams that work in, with data in their specific way. We also needed to have uh, different tech stacks, because we have Drupal, with, which is what we work with, but there are plenty of other, as she said before, homegrown solutions. There's Salesforce data that, you know, we want people to work in the tool that they're comfortable with. And we didn't want to sit there and say, oh, by the way, now you have to do, learn Drupal to work with us. It didn't make sense. So we, they needed to be able to work at the tech stack that they already used. And then additionally, we wanted to have it specifically be a single source of truth. This is something you can rely on for product data for customer portal. So our solution, wait for it, data lake. So looking back at our requirements from before, um, with a data lake, we get scalable, low maintenance solutions. Uh, we have flexible structure, and the, there's also a schema on read option with data lakes where you can uh, apply a schema onto the data when you're pulling it out rather than when you're indexing it. Um, it also, or there's lots of tools for connecting with our current tech stack. There's Drupal modules, there's GraphQL, there's PHP drivers. Um, and then as far as being able to set something up as a single size source of truth, you can bring your own government, governance, so you can make it your single source of truth. But with great flexibility comes great responsibility. Isn't that right, Melissa? That's correct, April. 
we didn't plan that at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks. So whenever you remove some of these governance tasks from Drupal's purview, it means that you now have to do it in a different way. And uh, one of the things that we had to guard against was what we call data rot, which is when your data gets out of date, like why is this in here? This is you know three years old. This should have been deleted a long time ago. Just things that normally in a in a CMS is like second nature. I unpublished that. It's unpublished. It's removed from the site. All the the things we take for granted. And we also wanted to make sure that we're not uh, having to reinvent the wheel more than we have to, right? To to make this work. So we wanted to rely on things that were already present in Drupal to manage the content itself. We wanted to establish a governance plan. Um, specifically around who is allowed to put things in, what kind of data we put in, how they use it. Uh, and that's the biggest thing I think that was really hard to get down because we had to get people to agree. <laughs> and when you have lots and lots of people who all have things that they need, it's harder to get them to agree on what they're actually going to put in and how. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that we restricted it in a way that protected customer data if there was any involved in what we were indexing. We also wanted to make sure that we were protecting anything that was gated so that if there was security information in there related to like a release that had not yet been made public, we wanted to make sure that that didn't go in. Um, specifically, not that uh, people would use it in, in a bad way, but I wanted to make it harder to do the wrong thing, right? Because when you have a really big system like this and it's removed from the, the, the original source that created it, it's easy for someone to see, well, the data is there, I'm going to post it but they wouldn't necessarily know, oh, not yet, right? So we wanted to make sure that once something went in that it was free for someone to use. And that was a really big, important piece to get into the system. Um, and other things like GDPR, we wanted to make sure that we were able to accurately identify information that needed to be managed to uh, stay in compliance with privacy concerns. And I guess it goes without saying, when you have a large company like Red Hat, it has to scale. It has to work really well. It has to, uh, has to be performant. Uh, with redhat.com, it gets a lot of hits. And I don't know the traffic on redhat.com, but on the portal, we get like over 300, or I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong, over 3 million hits a month. And I did the traffic analysis before I left, and we were getting 15,000 hits an hour, which is a lot. I've never worked on a site quite this large. <laughs> So it's, it's very, very large for us. And we wanted to make sure that that was maintained, or at least that if we were going to do something, it didn't make it worse, right? We wanted to always make something better. And uh, the, the other thing that we liked about this data lake concept is that the architecture itself is simple. Um, anyone who's worked with Drupal at scale knows that, yeah, you can do it, but there are a lot of different things you have to do to make it happen. And there are a lot of layers, but we wanted something really simple. Uh, and this that uh, covers that. Additionally, uh, this acts as a caching layer for Drupal. Everyone knows that with Drupal there's a lot of caching involved in general, just within Drupal itself. You can add additional layers on top of that. But the, the data lake itself, if you do it the way we're doing it, it allows you to then, it becomes kind of your presentation layer of Drupal instead of using a traditional HTML page. So our solution was MongoDB. This is what we ended up using for our database backend for our data lake. One of the things we liked about MongoDB is that it, uh, it doesn't care about what you put in. It just says, oh, you have data in here, that's great. It's JSON blobs, it just goes right in. And that is in alignment with our schema being configurable, customizable, things like that. Uh, it's not opinionated about what you put in as long as, it, as long as it's a JSON object, you're good to go. Uh, so that, that was the direction we went. So here's the nitty gritty. This is the Drupal part. You're like, you're talking about all these different things. What about Drupal? This is the Drupal part. So this is where Drupal comes in, into play. In order to make this happen, we decided to go with Search API, which most people, everybody here knows about Search API, right? You've used Search API before. I see three people nodding their heads. More people, yay, okay, somebody back there. Uh, we made a custom backend that interacts with MongoDB. Uh, so there, there's the MongoDB module on Drupal.org. And then we also use Search API on top of that. Using this custom backend, it allowed us to create an event that we could fire, and then we could react to that event with a subscriber using you know, Drupal 8 plus concepts. 
And uh, because of how Search API works, it helps you prevent data rot, the things we were worried about, right? If something changed, it would go in instantaneously. You automatically have access to all of Search API's filters, or, or plugins, I should say. So if something's unpublished, you can have it removed, all those different things. It simplifies a lot of the, the process. We can rely on the, the shoulders of people before us and, and build upon that. And additionally, uh, it allowed us to be flexible with our schema, which is absolutely a requirement for this. When we were creating our data, we decided that there are kind of two different levels of, of, of data we needed to, to worry about. There's what we call primary data, which is information that should be shared across all records. So that way, if you're indexing, you can rely on that being present, like a title, right? Created date, updated date, author, those kinds of things. And then what we call secondary data, which is where you can make it customizable for the source. So for our product data, it would be things like um, logos, links to logos, or a description that's specific to a product, uh, things like that. So it allows you to, to then diverge from that primary list of data and create a unified schema that allows you to query things consistently. And then on top of that, you get all that Drupal has to offer. So you have access control for the, the UI, you have permissions, you have security and privacy, you've got all the good things that Drupal offers involved in the creation of that content and the management of that content. You don't have to reinvent the wheel to make it work. It's just that in the end, when you hit save, instead of it showing up on a, on a web page, like a standard Drupal web page, it gets indexed into this data lake. And then as far as uh, retrieving that data, we have, like I said before, single page applications and Drupal sites. So on the single page applications, they're using GraphQL, a GraphQL layer on top of MongoDB. And uh, for the Drupal solution, which I've been working on, we've been using the PHP MongoDB driver to just query the Mongo database or MongoDB database uh, directly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our implementations. And hey, we're in our implementations. <laughs> Your transitions are so smooth. Yeah. So good. Try. <laughs> um, so again, back to our product experience, which is this, the reason we keep coming back to this is this was our proof of concept for the data lake. Uh, we only just launched a, pro a page using this concept earlier this year and it was the result of two years of discovery, conversations, and effort uh, to make it happen. And the best part about it to me was that this is our product index page. It's at access.redhat.com slash products. You can go there today, you can see it, you can see it rendering. This is a single page application that pulls information from MongoDB using GraphQL. There's a GraphQL layer. We're not gonna get into the GraphQL layer because that's actually not something, we have another team that manages that part for us. So we we're talking specifically about the Drupal portion. But the, the thing I loved about this is that the measurement of success was that our customers didn't notice that it had changed, right? <laughs> that literally we swapped it out from being an HTML blob in a, in a node to this statically built page and nothing changed on, to their perception other than that it was like 200 or 300% faster when it loaded because it, it didn't bootstrap Drupal to do anything. There was no caching layer on top of it. It literally was just a statically generated page that went popped right up, okay? And the thing I loved about it is that our front end developer, when we launched it, I was like, Chase, are you so excited? You don't have to ever touch Drupal again if you don't want to. And he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. That's like specifically what he said. Because now he doesn't have to touch the content anymore. He can just focus on the build. He can focus on the code. He can focus on beautifying the actual presentation of the data, which is what he wants to be doing anyway. And we're generating this via a GitLab pipeline every 30 minutes. So it automatically rebuilds the page every 30 minutes. We can change that timeline, and we're still kind of tweaking what that timeline looks like. But for, to start with, that's what we did, because our product information doesn't change often enough to make it more than that. But it does work really, really well so far. Um, and I think the bottom point here is the one that I think is super important, where because it was a page content type before, and there are a lot of people in this site, people could have technically deleted this page. <laughs> and then we would have no product index page anymore. And now it's protected from that by being a, a spa. We call it spa, static. Our single page application is a spa. Uh, it has two different displays. There's an index page, there's a category view that you see here. 
Um, on the category view, we also have the ability, actually on both views, but we're pulling in translations from Drupal as well as part of the data lake. This, you, you can tell that not all of this is translated because we're still getting the translations in, but I wanted to show you that that's actually present on the page and it supports it natively from the data lake. Um, and just in April, we launched our product pages themselves using this same architecture. And you look at this page and I, I mean, you look at this and you're like, well, that could be a Drupal page. Absolutely, it could be a Drupal page. No, no questions about that. But because it's statically generated, because we're pulling things in from the data lake, because we're using GraphQL, we can do things like the, the section down there that's documentation, that's pulled from a completely separate team that uses a custom homegrown documentation storage system that has nothing to do with Drupal and knows nothing about Drupal. But we can pull that information in. And there are tons of ways you can do this, absolutely. But for us, the foundational data layer we're building here allows us to then build new things off of it. And so we're building that structure now. Um, for this particular one, product lifecycle API, which we have for our customer portal, it handles end of life data and things like that. We're actually using that to set our titles of our products. Every so often the, the company will tweak a name of a product or rebrand something. And getting that information out to the public is a slow process. And I remember when I was doing a proof of concept of the Drupal system and I built this, this integration for the API, that uh, a name change had come through that night. And uh, my manager was like, hey, does this support like pulling in updates? And I was like, you mean this update that's already here right now that came in last night? It was like already in. And I was like, and when it changes the name, it saves the old name in an alternative name field so that it supports it for solar searching across all the websites. And he's like, that's so cool. I was like, it's amazing. <laughs> because then we don't have to do it anymore, right? We don't have to do it manually. Um, and then uh, something that I did add for this particular instance is canonical links are managed in Drupal as well. So that's not something that someone's adding uh, by hand anymore. There's a lot of validation there. Uh, let's see. This is a new feature we added, which is product bundles. So some of our products have products within them. There's a, there's a bundled section in the middle there where it says included with Red Hat AMQ on here. Um, those are bundled products. And in Drupal, that's just an entity reference, right? But in the data lake, it doesn't have, it doesn't have any opinions about what things are. So because we now have this unified ID, this an internal, um, this internal source of truth, we can recreate, kind of recreate that process, but in the data lake instead, and then make that available for other systems to query in the same way. Um, so we can actually pull in all the same information, d documentation links, those kinds of things in this way. But then other systems could do the same. So they would actually be able to say, oh, I want to know all the bund bundled products with Red Hat AMQ. Here they are. So for the UI on the back end, this is pretty com I mean, you'll see this. This is basically Claro and the, the new beautiful admin UI on the back of Drupal. I think it's Drupal 10. It's default now, isn't it? Drupal 10. Is it not yet? Okay. But Anyway, this is Claro. Uh, I made a custom product entity using, using Drush. And uh, the, the bundles entity then is pretty standard. You see this kind of stuff all the time where you've got an entity reference field and you, you reference those in. And um, one thing I did do, which I was, you know, it's, it's a small thing, but it's really nice, is that the order of the products being added to the bundle are respected in the data lake so that our product admin who's managing all this data, she can just rearrange these fields and then on the front end, it'll reflect it automatically. And every time she saves the product bundle, it triggers an update to the data lake, it's instantaneously available so that when it's next built, it shows up on the page. So, to sum up, <laughs> you manage your data in Drupal, you index it into the data lake using Search API, you query it with GraphQL, you build it with a GitLab pipeline, and it's refreshed every 30 minutes, and then you enjoy your newly automated life. Oh. <laughs> and I get to follow that act. Wow, <laughs> all right. So for the first uh, site that my team integrated the learning paths data lake was the developers.redhat.com. This is a site to uh, learn about new products and technologies at Red Hat. 
And just so we know like what a common understanding of what a learning path is, a learning path is a curated collection of content directing users to learn more about a particular topic or product. So the idea is that any content that can be a part of a learning path, like an article or a cheat sheet, for example, um, they're indexed into the learning path data lake uh, collection. So we have a separate collection from the products collection in MongoDB. And then once that content is indexed, it can be referenced and displayed in the context of learning paths. So the way that we're doing this is we have a learning path content type and a resource content type. Um, learning paths reference resources in an entity, re entity reference field. So we're using, in this screenshot here, we're using the entity browser contrib module for a nice UX um, so that you can see card views of existing resources within your site and then you can create a resource in the little tab there at the top. And so the resource uh, content is just a container for data lake content. Um, we're using the external data source contrib module. So it allows us to create this autocomplete field. And you can see we're looking for a title that's based on title. But it shows you like the, a little snippet of like the origin site that RHDP is the developer site. Um, we see what type of content it is, what language it is, and the title. And when you click on it, then it puts this um, universal or this UUID here for the data lake into the text field, and that's what we're using to then pull that data. Um, and we also have, uh, we're using the automatic entity label control module and a custom token so that when you save this resource, it's going to use the data lake title as the title of the node so that anytime you update that node, then it will match. Um, and we're also using the allow only one contrib module so that we don't have tons of resources referencing the same data lake data. We should only have one, a one to one ratio there. So then if we look back at our example that I showed previously, we see we now have like a hero and a sidebar that are driven by the learning path content type. And then the data inside there is coming from the data lake. So to display our data lake data in card and contextual views, we're using a preprocess hook. So we take that UUID, we query uh, MongoDB, we get that data back, and we add it to the render array so that Twig can use it however our front end developers want to show it. Um, the way that we're doing this is we have an internal contrib module that is pulling all this stuff together um, in a consistent way. So we've got the, the main points are that we have um, the ability to set our schema in this module. So anybody that is putting content into the data lake, the learning pass data lake, has the same schema. Um, we're also, we have a service used to query the data lake. So if we ever change and add a different uh, way of querying, if we're not going to query directly, we add a GraphQL layer, we can just swap out that service as well. Um, and then just reusable code. So we've got a controller, like you were seeing before with the, the hero in the sidebar. We have a controller for viewing resources within the context of a learning path. And that will allow us to um, reuse resources on different learning paths. So you may have like some setup instructions or something like that. That can be a part of any learning path and you can still see it in the context of each learning path. Um, that was pretty cool to work on. Um, and then the event subscriber that she was talking about before, we're using to pre-process the data and make sure it looks the way that we want to before it's indexed. And we have a couple of constraints and validators just to make sure that um, when you're referencing content, you know, does this, is this UUID actually correspond with data lake data, those sorts of things. And so, yes, that's a lot of stuff for just like showing a learning path. Um, but the idea is that what we did last month was to integrate the hybrid cloud site with the same module so that now you can create a learning path on the developer site and reference content on the cloud site and vice versa. You can create a learning path on the cloud site and reference articles, cheat sheets, ebooks from the developer site. Um, so this was basically a first proof of concept of how we can share this data across Drupal, Drupal sites. And we have other teams at Red Hat that are interested in continuing to expand the capabilities of this uh, shareability. All right, so our future plans. And I wanted to make sure that I called out um, that actually the customer portal is looking to reuse some of this learning path stuff that she's been building as well. So. When we talk about it being an internally contrib module, that's something that we coined because 
we have so many Drupal instances, we have kind of our own ecosystem internally. Um, but we're always looking for ways that we can uh, contribute that back whenever possible, uh, which we'll show you in a minute. Uh, so the, for the customer portal side of things, things we're looking at doing are standardizing our product taxonomy. Um, there's <laughs> we have product taxonomy on most of our sites right now, but because they're maintained manually, they're all different, all of them. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really getting out of hand. So uh, when I say that when I say that we're doing this, um, one thing to keep in mind, because the customer portal is at one do subdomain, access.redhat.com, but we're currently in the process of splitting it into seven different Drupal instances. And in order to make that feasible, we have to have a way to share a lot of these dif this different information. So that's one of the reasons, like, you look at this and you're like, this is a lot of work <laughs> to share this stuff when a single Drupal instance could do it. And that's true, absolutely. If you look at what we built, it's completely overbuilt for what we've done so far, but it's the foundation for what we're going to do later, one of them being product taxonomy. Um, and once we get that available, sites like developers could use that shared taxonomy module as well on their site and standardize the presentation across their site as well. Uh, another thing we talked about doing is integrating other systems at Red Hat, like uh, our subscriptions information and our... Uh, Let's see, again, more, more information from product life cycle. So we can do things like when a product gets and becomes end of life or an end of life date is announced, then we can use our notification system on the customer portal to say, hey, did you know that this was just announced? Here's detail on that. Here are some articles on that from our site. So we can create this really great customer experience for, uh, to get people, again, get them what they need when they need it. Oh, this is still me, sorry, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, the other thing we wanted to do is, I, I was calling it content syndication, but that sounds like RSS feeds, which is not what it is. It's really patterns, which you would basically create content, store the HTML, the rendered HTML, in a data lake object, and then you could actually reuse it across multiple Drupal sites. So you could have someone create like, hey, this is, a, this is a new feature of this product, and you can show it on all the sub-product pages that it, uh, it goes with. And again, in a normal Drupal instance, this would be like a block, like a simple block with an entity reference, and you're good to go. But because we have multiple Drupal instances going on, this is a way to do that. Yeah, then as far as uh, the learning paths, uh, we're looking at like learning path discovery, like she was talking about on the customer portal. If you subscribe or purchase a product, it would be nice to know where you can learn more about how you can use that product, right? So um, being able to share that data in that uh, way, we're also looking at adding the GraphQL layer or subgraph layer, um, similar to what they've done with the single page apps so that it can be used by single page apps if someone wants to use it in that way. Um, and then I think it's just as far as like enhancing the learning path stuff, uh, gamifying learning paths, like making it so that you can actually earn a badge or something when you've completed a learning path. That data may not be strictly put into a data lake, but like something that we are looking to enhance our learning path experiences. Oh, it's still there. <laughs> so we went ahead and we actually did this presentation at DrupalCon Florida. DrupalCon Florida it is oh, Drupal Camp. It is not a con. It is not a con, it's a camp. <laughs> Drupal Camp Florida, and one of the main questions people asked is, where can we see this code? And I was like, you can't. So I did this. This is a sandbox module on drupal.org. Uh, you can absolutely use the short link that I put up there. It's not gonna like ask you for anything or track you. It's really just to make it shorter. Um, but also I put the long one at the bottom here, which is the actual sandbox link to uh, the module. I will say, caveat, it is untested. I took out all the Red Hat-isms from it, but it also means that you know, we're listed as, as maintainers, so you guys can connect with us that way if you'd like to. Absolutely, in the spirit of Drupal, we are accepting contributions, but within this module, it shows you the event subscriber, it shows you the, the custom database backend. There's also some example code in there of how to implement a schema, how to get that into the, to the data lake the way you want it. Uh, there are some really good README articles in there about how to set up a, a MongoDB instance on your local to get it a proof of concept for yourself. If you wanted to present this to someone else as like a, hey, this is a great idea, <laughs> I like this idea. Um, and again, we're, we're available for conversation and, and, and help whenever you guys need it. 
Yeah, so these slides will be available, and we put our resource links in these couple pages here. Um, <laughs> so, there it is. Um, so thank you to Red Hat for letting us work on cool stuff and for sending us here to speak. Thank you for DrupalCon for selecting our session, and thank you all for being here this early in the morning for our talk. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, if anyone has any questions, just now is the shout time. them out. I don't know. Raise your hand, whatever. <laughs> We've covered it all. Okay, yep. Okay, so the question is, are we uh, indexing to another search solution and indexing to solar as well? Um, the answer is yes. Yes, we have our, our search backend is um, also being indexed. So they're just separate indexes in search API. Mm -hmm. Not yet. This is our proof of concept to say, hey, come join us. <laughs> yeah, so that was the question was, uh, are there non-Drupal products putting data into the data lake? And we're not doing that at this moment, but, you know, the expansion. This is the foundation. I think we had a hand up back here. So the question is, well, why did we go with MongoDB? I will say it's because Jason Smith said it was a good idea, and he's sitting right there. So if you want to ask him a question, um, no, it was it was available, and we had we already had architecture in place to do it. It made it a really easy choice. Um, I can say that with all the different backends for Search API, you could totally do it with a different backend if you wanted to. But this was also a way to it was it was non complex to get it set up, and we needed that we needed to take some complexity out when it was already so complex. Right here. Um, you mentioned that you have some SPAs on top of your Drupal CMS. Are you looking to do more decoupled instances for your site going forward? Do you see Drupal just being the CMS, a workhorse, and all of your front ends running on separate uh, frameworks and applications? Yeah, so the question is are we looking to further or continue to use single page applications or SPAs? to be the front end of our website and keeping Drupal as the content management system. She, you get to repeat the questions and I get to answer them? Yes. Um, so the answer is sometimes. Uh, we have, for, for the customer portal, we have a lot of single page applications in place for various reasons. And so I would say that it's a case by case basis. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. And I don't want to do a blanket statement and say, we're doing decoupled all the time no matter what, because sometimes it just doesn't make sense. But sometimes it does. So in situations where we need it to be highly performant and highly available, things like that, we tend to go towards spas. And I've built highly performant, highly available Drupal sites before. Um, so not to say that Drupal can't, but it, I, I would say that it's a lot more accessible for our, our front end developers, because it's a lot easier to find a React developer than a front end Drupal developer. Um, and we have a lot of those. <laughs> Um, and it just makes it, it makes it easier to cater to the skill sets of the people we have. So kind of back and forth, I would say. And, uh, and, and again, we're not, we're not looking to be like this, like, like thumbs down on Drupal all the time. It's more of a case by case basis. Yeah, the, the follow-up question is, uh, can we share a case where a spa makes more sense? Is it? Okay, a spa makes more sense. Yeah. So we have, um, we have listings of like vulnerability information, which would normally be probably a view in Drupal, but it's really easy to do that in a React application. So that's one. That's one that I can think of. Uh, there's also a case where we have um, our... We call them vulnerabilities, but we're revamping those to be called security bulletins, which is basically Red Hat's response to a CVE. Those are staying in Drupal. And they have elements that are uh, asynchronous, like a thumbs up, thumbs down feature, commenting, those kinds of things. Those are asynchronously handled with JavaScript, but the page itself is rendered with Drupal. And those will stay that way for now, or uh, for the foreseeable future, let's say it that way. So those are two different situations. Mm -hmm. 
Any more questions? So, in the back. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, um, why did we choose to use MongoDB instead of a relational database like Oracle or something like that? So one of the things we needed to have happen in the, in the data lake is we needed it to not be, not be opinionated about the data that goes into it because we have, like I said, the primary schema and then the secondary. And it's to, to store those objects as one piece of content in MongoDB is a lot simpler to just say, here you go. There's no maintenance on the database side other than keeping it up and adding users as necessary. Um, the schema itself is maintained by us externally. And then in, we, we basically the Drupal instance uh, enforces the schema that we create. So it takes out a layer. So if we need to change something, we don't have to go to another team to do it. Not, again, not that we can't do it ourselves, but it just makes it, we can pivot more quickly, and we needed that for this proof of concept. So that's one of the reasons, another reasons we chose MongoDB. Scalability. Scalability, yeah, uh, is another one in performance. If there was a Drupal 9 MongoDB search API module, would you have used it, or is your application like too specific? Yeah, so the question was if there was a search API related module for MongoDB, would we have used that instead of our homegrown solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that there was anything for a backend. Um, right to index into MongoDB, so yeah. Uh, that's why this was created, for sure. Um, I don't know if it's something that could be additionally added to the MongoDB module itself, or if it just makes more sense for it to be this standalone project and end up becoming a contrib module instead of a sandbox, but yeah. Yeah, and really the only reason, there, well, there are two reasons. One, we needed the back end, but the second one was to give us an event we could, res we, we could subscribe to, to, to apply the schema in the first place. Um, there are some things, I mean, you can do this with the, if your schema is flat, then you can use Search API to do it, because Search API will let you, you know, you can do standard mapping through the UI just like you normally do with Search API. But we had some, <laughs> we had some, uh, I really didn't want Drupal to leak out into my data at all. And we all know that Drupal tends to leave bits and pieces of itself all over the place. <laughs> uh, with, uh, I mean, Drupal 7, right? Like lang language none, zero value situations. So uh, those kinds of things. I wanted the data to be, I wanted, if someone looked at our data, I wanted them to have no idea where it came from. I wanted them to be like, That's, that data looks great to me. And, and not have to know anything about Drupal to access it. Uh, so I was, I was opinionated about how the information got in, so that was one reason. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to have full control over it because I didn't know how people would use it. Like April's project, I didn't know how she was going to use the schema. So I basically was as, I was trying to be as unopinionated about that schema as possible when I created the module. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you mean internally contrib modules or? Yeah, like your internal contrib modules. Oh. How do you all manage that? Yeah, so the question is how do we manage our internal contrib modules? That's probably another whole session. Um, we do have a status server. Um, yeah, again, Jason, Jason Smith, Smith is here. <laughs> we probably know more about these details. But we're, we're adding, we add basically a repository in our composer. And we're pulling those packages in similar to a Drupal contrib module. It's just it knows where to find our modules. Yep. And then I have a process where we create a tag for the module and it creates the package and it adds the version information just like Drupal does. Um, yeah, thank you to our digital acceleration team at Red Hat for those fun technologies uh, that make things easier. Yeah. Did those two websites have the same module installed? The learning path and then the other um, customer portal? They are sharing. So the. The, he asked if the if the sites were sharing the same module. We're using uh, an internal indexing module that is similar. So it's you know the learning path module is built on top of that to say okay, 
this is how I'm indexing using this module. Here's my schema and all of that and how the learning path stuff is going to use that index process. The, really, the index module is the MongoDB module that you shared, right? Yeah, it's this one. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And the, the examples that are in here are actually, uh, I took some of the, like I said, I took the Red Hat isms out of it, but the example event, event subscriber that's in this module is pulled from the one that I made. So if you look at it, you'll see the primary data, the secondary data, that kind of stuff in there. Um, it also allows you to do things like our GraphQL team didn't like the idea that, because Search API is really geared towards solar most of the time. So it requires all of your keys, like your, your object keys, to be lowercase. And we wanted them to be camel case for just because we wanted that. <laughs> so when you're doing your schema, like, like mapping and stuff like that on the back end, you can actually you can do that and tell it to be to be camel case and do some pre-processing. Uh, that's actually how I get the locales information in for translations because the way Drupal stores it right as a single node, but if you're indexing it with search API, it'll index them as individual records, but we wanted them to be one record. So we actually have one record and then we have a locales key, like a, a property in there, and anything that's translated goes under there. So that's how we that's how we architected it. But we needed it that way. So that's what we did. Uh, and that's that's actually in there too. I left the locales mapping. I, I'm pretty sure I left it in there. So if people wanted to do, do translation, they could. Yeah. Yes. Maybe it's not important for the moment, but I don't know if you have thought about translation for other platforms you might be doing. Translation for for what we're doing here. So the question was, did, did we trans, have we thought about translating our application to allow for other locales, like other languages? And this supports out of the box whatever you tell it to do. So if you want your properties to be in French, your properties will be in French. If you want your primary Drupal, uh, well basically whatever your primary language is on, on your site is what your schema's primary language is. So you have full customizable control over how that data goes in. So for us, our locales or our, our, our languages we support on the customer portal are English as primary, but we also have Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. And, uh, and we're actually considering adding French, actually, yes. And, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't flip-flop that and make French your primary and make English your secondary. You could absolutely do that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was, I'll do it this time, April. Okay. You can take a rest. Uh, the, the question was, are we considering using this data lake for, all, for everything or is it just for customer facing? And I think for now we're starting with public information because it makes it easier to protect the privacy concerns that we talked about. Uh, we are talking about an access layer to protect like who's allowed to access what, um, but that's still in process and we didn't want to delay the development to get that in place. So we started off with public information. Um, and it's, it's the classic thing of, you can tell someone, hey, we're thinking of doing this, and they're like, that sounds great. Come back to me when you've done it, um, which now we have. So we're actually getting a lot of people that are interested in it because we actually have proof of concept between April with her uh, presentation with the learning paths is a completely separate and different implementation than mine. But they're both using the same, same concept. And both of us have been getting lots of people saying, hey, I want to learn about that. We're like, hey, you should go listen to this presentation we did. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's what we're starting with. I have, a, I have a feeling it'll expand over time. But uh, we just wanted to get a proof of concept out the door and then build upon it. I'm looking at Jason Smith. Does Red Hat have, the question was, does Red Hat have other data lakes? We have other 
types of data, like repositories, they're for different purposes. Um, and I would say that they were probably considered to be closed and should stay closed for the use case that they're, they're made for. This is specifically engineered for public information and specifically engineered to unify our public facing sites. So that's why we made this one. And we are at time, so I want to make sure I honor your time. We are absolutely here for questions if you guys have more, but otherwise, enjoy DrupalCon. Thank you for coming. Thank you.